So the first problem we're going to look at, or really topic, is momentum. Now, when it comes to momentum, there's two main groups of questions we can go into. Conservation of momentum, and then there's impulse. We're going to start with conservation of momentum with the conservation of momentum equation, which simply says P initial equals P final. This is conservation of momentum. It's also worth mentioning what is the equation for momentum? That's going to be P equals mass times velocity. And a lot of times when you have multiple momentums, like there's two objects, then I can say P total is equal to moment, uh, momentum one plus momentum P two plus et cetera, et cetera, however many objects you have. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the initial and the final. We are talking about the total, just to be clear. And when do we care about conservation of momentum? It's when we're considering all the objects in the problem. In other words, two objects are colliding into each other and they give us information about both. This is when we're talking about conservation of momentum. Unlike energy, where energy sometimes momentum is conserved, some, or <clears throat> sometimes energy is conserved, sometimes it's not conserved, momentum is always conserved. It just depends if you're looking at all the objects or not. So we're going to start with problems where we are considering all of the objects. So here's the first problem. Let's say I have two blocks heading towards each other, one with a mass of one kilogram, the other with a mass of four kilograms. The one kilogram object is going to be heading with a velocity of five meters per second. The four kilogram object is going to be heading towards the object with a speed of two meters per second. They're going to collide, and then after the collision, they're going to have the following velocities. Velocity, the one kilogram block, is now going to be heading to the left at two meters per second, and the four kilogram object is going to have an unknown velocity which is what we're going to be solving for. <clears throat> now, as you can imagine, the four kilogram object is probably going to be moving to the right after this collision. That is probably the case, but of course we are going to confirm by using the conservation of momentum equation. So first things first, P initial equals P final. I need to find the momentum in each case. Here's the initial case. Here's the final case. In initial and final. In other words, before the collision, after the collision. Because in general, how do I know if I'm dealing with a momentum question? I'm dealing with momentum if I'm talking about either explosions, which is things like exploding into different pieces, or if I'm looking at collisions. This is obviously the collision case. So I'm going to set up my equation. P initial, the initial, like the, the top case, before we even collide, is going to equal the mass of the one kilogram object times its velocity. So I can say M1 V1 plus the mass of the four times its velocity, m4, v4. I can even plug this in if I want to, because I know mass one is one, v1 is positive five, plus mass four, which is four kilograms, times its velocity, two meters per second. And so I'll get an initial momentum of five plus eight, so 13, and the units are the kilogram meter per second. Any questions so far? Okay. So now for the final, the final is going to be the following. P final equals, for this momentum, oh, I have to be careful, actually, because I just heard I made a mistake. And that was a test, and you all failed. No, I, I, I'll be honest when I make a mistake. So it's not going to be plus 4 times 2. It is going to be minus 4 times 2. Why? Because that velocity points to the left. It's a minus 2 for the velocity, so it's minus. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Like, it's not going to be 13 anymore. It's going to be 5 minus 8. So actually, it's negative three. Any questions? Okay, so P final now is going to be the following. The one kilogram mass, one, times its velocity, negative two, again, because it points to the left, plus the four kilogram object times its velocity, which we don't know. I'll just call it V or V final or, or whatever I want to call it. And again, this equals P initial. This equals negative 3. I'm setting the 2 equal to each other. That's what conservation of momentum says. And now it's just a question of solving an easy equation. It's going to be negative 2 plus 4V equals negative 3, which means that I'm going to add 2 to both sides. We get that 4V equals negative 1. 
V is going to equal negative one fourth meter per second. In other words, the object is not moving to the right. The four kilogram object is also moving to the left at a speed of one fourth meters per second. So what I would write is I would write one fourth meters per second to the left. To the left. And that's the answer for this first one. Any questions? So that's going to be how the majority of conservation of momentum problems go. There are a few examples that are really tough. And the two examples I would say that are really tough are when the objects are moving in two different dimensions. Like we have an X component and a Y component. And then the other case is when we're talking about elastic collisions and conservation of energy, which I'm going to just briefly talk about for that case. So what, there's three kinds of collisions. Number one is there's elastic. Then there's, I'm going to leave a space for myself to write in the definitions, but inelastic. And then uh, very last, there's perfectly inelastic. So an elastic collision is, where, is a collision where momentum and energy are conserved. Everything's conserved. In an elastic collision, momentum and energy are conserved. An inelastic collision is one where only momentum is conserved. In other words, some energy is lost. Only momentum is conserved. <clears throat> and then the last case, perfectly inelastic, we would say momentum is, is conserved. Because again, momentum is always conserved in these cases. Momentum is conserved and the objects stick together. These are the three kinds of collisions. When would I see a question on this? I would think it would be multiple choice and you, it gives you the information. You want to find if the collisions elastic, inelastic, or perfectly inelastic. Check the initial and final energies. That's my advice to you. Except perfectly inelastic is easy because if they stick together, you're already done. But how can you tell if it's elastic or inelastic? Remember, we always have this equation, P initial equals P final. But this does not always hold true. The total energy initial does not always equal the total energy final. We would check that. And as long as you're on a flat surface, we would say, because it's kinetic energy, 1 half M1 V1 squared plus one half m2 v2 squared, assuming this is two objects, which is most cases, you want to know if that equals one half m1 final v1 final squared plus, I ran out of room, one half m2 v2 final squared. Probably should have also wrote i instead of one, so I'll do that real quick. i, 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 i. What I'm trying to say is it's the initial values versus the finals. Do they equal each other? That's how you can tell. If, if, the, if yes, they equal each other, then great. It's elastic. If they don't equal each other, it's inelastic. But the problem I want to look at today is not even necessarily on any of this. I just want to give you the definitions. What I really want to focus on today is probably the hard, even harder than this, is two-dimensional collisions. Because those are definitely harder, in my opinion. Let's say I have the following scenario. I'm at a red light. We have this object heading towards the right at a speed of 10 meters per second, which is roughly 20 miles per hour. We'll say this has a mass of 1,000 kilograms because it's a car. Then I'm going to say we have another car. This one's heading north at a speed of 15 meters per second, and it's going to have a velocity of, I'm not, a mass of 800 kilograms. So we have two cars heading towards each other. They are going to crash. They're going to collide. And then the resulting mass is going to head northeast at an unknown velocity. And that's what I want to find for this problem. I will say for this problem, they do stick together. And that's information that they would have to tell you in the problem, like I am right now. Any questions with the setup? We're about to get into it. Okay. So for this one, what I want to say is, once again... P initial equals P final. Only one problem. I have that being true for the x-axis 
and also true for the y-axis. So for the x-axis, I'm going to have the equation p initial x equals p final x. For y-axis, I'm going to have p initial y equals p final y. They do need to equal each other. And if you hated dealing with components earlier in this class, I'm just going to tell you it's not going away anytime soon. We're still dealing with components now with momentum. So let's deal with the x-axis first. I have two cars. I'm going to label my cars A and B just for the sake of convenience. So for the x-axis, if I think of my initial momentum, only one of the cars is heading in the x direction, and it rhymes with bay. That's right, it's A. A is the only one moving in the x direction. We can all agree that B is moving in the y direction. So for that reason, when I say the initial x momentum, I'm only talking about car A, which means I'm looking at mass A times velocity A. That's initial. And I can even plug that in. I can say mass is 1,000. Velocity is 10, and we're good to go for the initial momentum. For the final, now we're looking at when the cars are headed together and they're heading up northeast at some component. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say mass total, or you can even say mass A plus mass B if you want. Actually, I'll write that instead because it's more clear. I'm going to say the mass final is mass A plus mass B. Again, that's because they stick together at the end, times their velocity. They are going to have the same velocity, and that velocity is unknown. But I don't just want to write V, because V, my final answer, whatever you want to call this, that's at an angle. In other words, I want the X component. I'm going to call it VX. VX. Now I can plug in. Mass A was 1,000. Mass B is 800 times VX. I can actually find the X component right now. So this is going to be 1,000 times 10, which is 10,000, is equal to 1,000 times 800, which I probably don't need a calculator for, but I, I'm live on the air. i got to make sure I know what I'm doing. It's going to be 800,000, which is a pretty big number. So now, to find Vx, all I need to do is... Are do you adding mass a and b instead of like multiplying them i knew i was doing something wrong thank you that was bad thank you so it's going to be 1800 this makes way more sense okay so it's going to be 10,000 divided by 1800 we get a final velocity in the x component of 5.56 meters per second. And again, that's the x direction. That is the x direction. Any questions so far? Okay. Now for the y axis, we're going to do something similar. As a matter of fact, it's, it's pretty much the exact same thing, except now I'm looking at car B. So and notice the initial velocity in the y direction, it's only car B. So it's going to be its velocity, which is well, I mean, it's mass, 800, times its velocity, which we're saying is positive 15, because it's heading north. If it was heading left or if it was heading down, I would say negative. But since they're all heading up and to the right, I can just say positive, and it's fine. So that's the initial momentum. The final momentum is going to be the combined mass of the objects. So mass A plus mass B, which is going to be, again, 1800. That stays the same, times the final velocity. Again, I don't know it. But I'm going to call it Vy, because it's the y component of velocity. And again, I'm going to multiply these together. 800 times 15. 800 times 15, which is 12,000. 12,000 is equal to 1,800 Vy. I divide both sides by 1,800. We get Vy is equal to 6.67, and the units are meters per second. This is not the final answer, but now we're very close. Again, this is the y direction now. So we have the x direction, we have the y direction. Hopefully, you people out there are thinking Pythagorean theorem. Because what we have here is a triangle. We have a right triangle right here with an x component of 5.56 and a y component of 6.67. And to find the total, the hypotenuse, all I need to do is Pythagorean theorem. The velocity is going to equal the square root of 5.56 squared plus 6.67 squared, the square root of the two components. 
When I plug this in my calculator, square root of 5.56 squared plus 6.67 squared, I get a final velocity of 8.68 meters per second. And that is how I deal with two-dimensional momentum problems. Any questions? Um, how do you know when you have to split it into the components? That's a good question. Would you agree with me that th when these two cars collide, one's heading to the right, one's heading up, that it has to be going at an angle, just logically speaking? Yeah. So for that reason, I know it's at an angle. I just don't know what the angle is. Luckily, you'll notice this problem. I never had to find the angle. I just had to find the X and the Y components. And luckily for my momentum equa equations, notice it wasn't too difficult. Because since I'm just dealing with first the X velocity unknown and then the Y velocity unknown, I could, I could relatively easily find both of those just using the equations. And then it's just a matter of Pythagorean theorem. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Okay. So that's pretty much it for momentum. Does anyone have any other questions on momentum before we get into angular stuff? Okay. So now for the rest of the time we have today, I'm not even sure if I'm going to go to the full hour. I just want to cover the topics that I do want to cover, and then I can answer questions at the end. But the next thing I want to talk about is I'm going to say angular kinematics. Because what, what you're going to start to notice is that for the rest of this course, you're just going to see angular versions of everything we've pretty much seen in the beginning of the course, starting with kinematics, of course, being angular kinematics now. So as an example, let's say I have um, a Ferris wheel, which is accelerating from rest. And you all know what the Ferris wheel is. It's like the giant ride in an amusement park. And let's say it's loading up the passengers, right? So it's going to start at rest. Start at rest. Let's say the radius of the wheel is 32 meters. It's a pretty big Ferris wheel. Let's say that it's starting to accelerate and it's going to go counterclockwise with an angular acceleration of, I have to be careful here, 0.1 radian per second squared. We'll talk about radians in, in like one second, but these are the units for alpha. And what I want to know is what is the angular speed after, let's say, 10 seconds. Okay, I'll give you guys a second to write that down. And I can tell you when it comes to, oh, why did I say kinematic? Kinematics with an S. Now, when it comes to any kind of kinematics problem, what I recommend you do is write down the five kinematic variables. Now, you don't need to write this down. I don't want you to write this down, but I just want to show you what I would do in, in normal kinematics. I would write V initial, V final, acceleration, time, and displacement delta X, and I would say what I know and what I don't know. Except I don't have those variables anymore. I have related ones. I have omega initial. That is omega. That is not W. I don't care if it looks like a W. It is omega, lowercase omega. It is omega initial, omega final, alpha, time, and delta theta for angle. These are the units now for angular kinematics. Omega is angular velocity or angular speed. In other words, how fast are you rotating? Angular acceleration is the change in angular speed, just like how acceleration was change in velocity. Time is obvious, and delta theta is how many revolutions did you make, except we measure in radians, not revolutions, unless the problem says otherwise. We'll be more specific about that later as well. But to answer this question, I need to start saying to myself, okay, what variables do I know? What do I not know? I said I start from rest, which is all about the angular velocity. That is going to be zero. It's initially not spinning. Omega final is what we're solving for because we want to find the final angular speed, like I said in the problem. Alpha, they tell us it's 0.1 and the time is 10 and we don't know anything else. So just like in regular kinematics, I would ask myself, do I know three of the five variables? Because if so, I can solve for whatever I want. In this case, I clearly have three, which means I can solve for omega final using which of the following kinematic equations. Does anyone know? Great. 
Omega final equals omega initial plus alpha time. Thank you. So for this one, luckily we can plug in numbers. Omega final equals unknown omega initial zero plus alpha, which is 0.1. And then the time is 10. We'll get omega final is one radian per second. Is that fast? Like how, how fast is that? I don't know. Let's calculate it. If I wanted to find the tangential velocity, if this is like a part B to the question, and that was part A, part B, find the tangential velocity on the outside of the wheel. We have an equation for tangential velocity that's related to omega, the angular velocity. And it is the following relationship. Velocity tangential, V sub t, is equal to omega times r, the angular speed times the radius. We're solving for tangential velocity here. Omega is going to equal the answer we just got, which is 1 times the radius, which is 32 meters. And so we'll get a final tangential speed of 32 meters per second. In other words, this Ferris wheel is moving at about 65 miles per hour. My advice to you, do not go on this Ferris wheel. That is ridiculously fast. Obviously I chose like random numbers here, so that's why that happened, but any questions? Any questions? Okay, great. Now I'm gonna talk about more about what exactly is Omega and to do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a conceptual question, which I've asked to some of you already But let's see if you remember the answer Let's say I have a record player and on the which is just a wheel as far as I'm concerned and on this record player I have two pennies one located over here and one located over here Which penny is gonna have the greater velocity which Which penny has the greater and i'll say tangential velocity just to be clear which penny has the greater tangential velocity let's say penny a or penny b now i don't want you to say this out loud i just want you to think in your heads for a second which penny do you think of course the same could also be an option so now that you've you've all taken a guess in your head let me explain first i want to talk about angular velocity, which is omega. So omega is the, not how fast tangential velocity is, but it's how fast is the object rotating. Let's say, hypothetically, this turntable completes one spin, one spin in one second. This is like the simplest example I can think of. If I, if I turn, if I make a full rotation in one second, what is my angular speed? Omega. In that case, omega is always delta theta over time. In other words, displacement, the angle over time. If I complete one full revolution, it doesn't matter if I say two pi radians. It doesn't matter if I say two pi radians over one second. I can also say one revolution in one second. I don't care. Omega is not dependent on how far away, what penny I'm, I'm looking at. It's the same no matter where I'm located. Is anyone confused by that? I'm saying the angular moment, the angular speed, sorry, the angular speed is the same for both. Any questions there? Okay, great. Now, remember, we have an equation for tangential velocity. Vt is equal to omega times r. In other words, if omega is the same, then all it really depends on is the radius. In other words, the higher the radius, the higher the tangential velocity. And which of these two pennies has the higher radius? It's a. For that reason, I would say A has the higher tangential velocity because it has the greater radius. Sorry for the sloppy handwriting. But A has the higher tangential velocity because it has the higher radius. Also, it kind of sounds weird if you're just reading this sentence normally. You're reading it as A has the, I'll say penny A. So we all know what we're talking about later when we're looking at our notes. But any questions on this conceptual question? 
Okay. Now we mentioned moment of inertia. So even if you haven't talked about mo moment of inertia in class yet, I'm telling you it's coming. I promise. And it's, it's honestly, it's one of the tougher concepts to kind of understand. So let's talk about it. Moment of inertia. Moment of inertia equals how hard is it to spin the object? How hard is it to spin the object? And the higher the moment of inertia, the harder it is to rotate. Think of the something that's hard to rotate, like if you've ever been in a revolving door. You really need to push that thing to get it moving, right? Versus a pinwheel. A pinwheel is so easy to move that you literally, it's one of those things you blow on and then it starts moving. So the higher the moment of inertia, the harder it is to rotate the object. But that's not super helpful in physics, I would say, because you're not going to have a question like that on the test you're likely going to have a question that exp that uses the equation for moment of inertia. And I've got bad news because the moment of inertia equation, the equation for moment, moment of, yeah, moment of inertia, the equation is I is equal to blank M R squared. Why did I say blank? Because it depends on what object you have. Depends on the object. So it really depends on the object you have. There's a bunch of different examples I can show you. I'll show you a couple real quick. If I have a hoop, this is an empty hoop, empty hoop, think like a hula hoop or a ring or, or anything like that. If I have an empty hoop and the equation is I sub hoop is equal to just M R squared. In other words, the coefficient is one. Then let's say I have a solid disc. This could be like a hockey puck, imagine but it's a solid disc, like a Frisbee, for instance, then I would say I sub disc is equal to one half MR squared. If I have a solid sphere, which I'm just going to draw this for a 3D representation. If I have a solid sphere, that equation would be I sphere equals two fifths. M R squared. You would, so do you have to memorize these numbers? No, I'll say you actually don't have to memorize these because this is just ridiculous how much stuff you'd have to memorize at this point because there's so many different shapes. You will be given a table with all the different equations on it and you'll be good to go. But there's one case that is going to be tricky and that's the point source of mass. And to represent it, I want to look at a dumbbell. We all know what a dumbbell is. Let's say it's, it looks like this, okay? Let's say there's 100 kilograms on each side and we're rotating about the center. And I'm going to ignore the, the bar in the middle. I'm just gonna say I care about the, the things on the outside. And I wanna know what's the moment of inertia for this object. Well, then the question becomes, what is the shape of these objects? Well, I don't care what the shape of the object is. Traditionally, the weights you know, are the shape of like disks. However, I'm gonna tell you they could be spheres, they could be solid. Um, discs, they could be hoops, they could be any shape they want, it doesn't matter because these are point sources of mass. So in this example, if I want to calculate I equals question mark, I'm going to say these are point sources of mass. Point sources of mass. What does that mean? It means that the axis of rotation, in other words, where I'm spinning it, the axis of rotation is some distance away, just for the sake of argument, let's say 0.5 meters for each plate. It means the axis of rotation is away from the actual object. Does everyone see what I'm talking about? It's not spinning about the, the wheel. So in other words, in order for a hoop to actually use the hoop equation, the hoop needs to be rotating like by itself. The, the hockey puck needs to be spinning on its own. But notice the plates aren't spinning on their own. I'm saying I'm spinning in reference to the center of the object. Please be honest. If this doesn't make sense to anyone, just please speak up because I, I want this to make sense. Or else why am I doing this? 
Can you explain it one more time? Yes. Let me let me go by this example. I think this would be this example would make sense. Imagine here's the sun and here's the earth, right? We all know that there are two different kinds of ways that the sun and the and the earth rotate. First, the earth can be rotating about the sun, right? That takes 365 days. Then the earth spins along its own axis, doesn't it? And how long does that take? That one takes 24 hours, right? So what I'm saying is when the earth is spinning about its axis, its own axis, then we consider it a sphere because it's spinning around about its own axis. When I say the 365 days, I'm considering a point source of mass to the sun. All the sun sees, it's not a sphere, it just sees a dot a, a really far away. So that's the point source of mass, which I've not given the equation for yet, but that's the difference. Is the object rotating about its own axis? Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. No problem. It, does it, it just, it, just be honest, is this confusing? I know it's confusing, but is anyone else really lost? Like, I think we can agree that these plates are like the Earth revolving around the sun, meaning that the axis rotation is in the middle and these plates are kind of going to be going uh, around it. So that's what I'm that's what I'm saying. OK, so the equation in general is just MR squared again. There's no coefficient. It's just MR squared. But notice I have two plates. I have two plates. So here's another thing about moment of inertia. I total is equal to I1 plus I2. So in order to find the total moment of inertia for this shape, I need to find the moment of inertia for each plate, for each plate. So in other words, what I would say is I total is equal to MR squared, which the mass of each of these plates is 100. 100 times the radius, which is 0.5 meters. I'm going to square that. And then I can kind of simplify the math and say times two because these are identical plates. I'm just adding the same number together. So it's times two. If I plug this in a calculator, I get 100 times two times 0.5 squared, I get 50. And the units for moment of inertia are of course everyone's favorite, the kilogram meter squared. I did not invent these units. By the way, I don't memorize the units. I ask myself, what's the units of mass and then what's the units of R squared? I just use the equation. And then I remember the units that way. Um, but I don't think you actually have to memorize this. There's certain stuff in this class I recommend you memorize. There's certain stuff I don't recommend you memorize. This is one of the things I don't memorize. I figure it out as I go. But that's it for moment of inertia. Does anyone have any questions? There's one more topic I want to talk about today. And that is torque. So again, you probably haven't talked about torque yet, but it's coming. So again, as I said before, every kind of equation that we have in this part of the year with angular stuff relates to something else in normal physics. Like for instance, angular velocity omega relates to just tangential velocity v. Um, you can say the same thing for angular acceleration. That one's kind of obvious. I'll even say moment of inertia. Moment of inertia actually corresponds to something in in normal physics. So moment of inertia I is actually just the rotational equivalent of mass. Because if you think about it, mass M is just how hard is it to push an object? That's what mass means. If you have a bigger mass, it means it's harder to move you. That's literally what mass is. And moment of inertia is how hard is it to rotate an object? So that's why they're related. Now, the last thing I want to say is torque. Torque, which is um, conveyed by the Greek letter tau, that is the equivalent of force. It is a rotational force. In other words, whenever you open a door, you will probably open a door at some point today even. When you open that door, you are going to be using torque. Why? Because you're using a force to rotate an object. You can really impress your parents by saying, Mom, Dad, I used, I used torque today because I rotated a door. And they'll be very proud of you, hopefully. So why, why am I even mentioning torque? It's because there's a couple reasons. Number one, the equation for torque, tau torque, is equal to a force times a distance times a sine of theta. We won't talk about the sine theta today, so I'm just going to tell you to ignore it for today. Um, but really, it means perpendicular. We want the force to be perpendicular 
to your displacement. Also, displacement can be rewritten as, as radius. If I want to, I could also write this equation. I can write FR or I can write FD because technically the distance is a radius as well. What do I mean by that? Well, when you open a door, where is it hinged? Where's the door hinged? That's not a trick. It's at the door hinges, right? So why is the doorknob on the other side of the door hinge? Have you ever thought about that? It's because that's going to give you the greatest radius, which means that gives you the greatest torque. There's a reason why they don't put doorknobs next to the hinge side. It's because of physics, and I think we can all agree it's, it's pretty obvious. But now we have an equation that actually explains that. The other relationship I want to talk about torque today is just how torque relates to moment of inertia and angular acceleration. What do I mean by that? Let me write down Newton's second law. Here's Newton's second law, which we learned earlier in the year. It said that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Everyone agrees with that, right? Kind of hard not to. So what I'm going to say is for torque, torque is equal to, which is, again, the rotational counterpart of force is torque. The rotation, rotational counterpart of mass is moment of inertia, I. The rotational counterpart of acceleration is alpha, the angular acceleration. This is Newton's second law for torques. This is for torque. And now we have a new way of, of finding torque. So back to the Ferris wheel example. Back to the Ferris wheel example where, again, we can consider the Ferris wheel. I'm going to say it's 32 meters. We can consider this to be a hoop, the Ferris wheel. I can say the mass of the Ferris wheel is probably ginormous. It's probably like 10,000 kilograms. It's a lot. I also said alpha was equal to 0.1, if everyone remembers, which means I can calculate the torque in my, in my Ferris wheel example. Torque is equal to I times alpha. Remember, I for the hoop, I for the hoop is just mR squared. I gave us the mass and I gave us the radius. The mass was 10,000 and the radius was 32 meters. So we're going to square that. So let's see what we get. 10,000 times 32 squared. That's a ginormous number, but it's 1024000. I think it's 10 million. Yeah, 10 million. There's the commas. Okay, so we found I, and then I said alpha was equal to 0.1, which means I just need to multiply these numbers together. Torque equals I times alpha. We end up getting a torque required to rotate this thing. It's going to be 1,024,000 newtons. I'm sorry, it's not newtons because torque is not measured in newtons because it's a force. Torque is measured in the Newton meter. Again, I don't, rem I don't remember that. I just know it's a force times a distance, which is a Newton times a meter. So that's how I remember that. And is that a big number? That's, that's probably the biggest torque I've ever done in any example ever. So that's exciting. But that's how we do it. We pretty much are going to be using the exact same equations we used in the first half of the year, except now we have a little spin on them, no pun intended, because we're dealing with angular angular stuff now in this last portion.